Okay. Welcome, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Okay, great. Um, well, hi. It is my pleasure to see you all online today. My name is Jessica Clemens, and right now I'm the Interim uh, Director of College Libraries at SUNY ESF. And I just want to thank you all for joining us today for SUNY Open Access Week. So welcome, everyone. Thanks for celebrating with us. Um, this is an international event, and what we're doing is trying to host some regional events. So thanks to all of you who are hosting local viewing parties on your own campus. This webinar series is part of the SUNY Council of Library Directors strategic plan to bring awareness and understanding of open access to 64 SUNY campuses and beyond. In addition to our terrific speakers, this theory was brought to you by the work of a talented and dedicated committee made up of members from various SUNY campuses, SUNY Press, and the Central New York Library Resources Council. And CLRC is hosting this Adobe Connect uh, webinar and also recording it, so a special shout out to them. Um, you can see a list of all of our committee members on the SUNY Open Access website, and that's posted in the chat. I'll also post it at the end of this webinar. Uh, we hope that this webinar series will launch deeper discussions and involvement around open access for our community. Our friends at CLRC will be monitoring the chat in case there are any technical problems, and I'll be looking at, to the chat window for any questions. So feel free to type questions as you think of them, um, but I want to make sure that Megan has enough time to share her presentation. So after her presentation is done, I'll facilitate the Q&A. Um, finally, if you are inclined to take part in social media, please try to use the webinar series hashtag SUNY OA week, um, and I'll po post that in the window as well. Um, we'd love to hear your thoughts. You can also tweet to Megan, and her twi Twitter handle um, can be found in the chat window. She's at Meg Wacha. So now it is my pleasure to introduce you to Megan. Uh, Megan Wacha is the scholarly communications librarian at the Central Office of Library Services for CUNY, that's the City University of New York. Um, so she's uh, downstate from Syracuse. She leads each of the campus libraries in the development and management of CUNY's open access institutional repository, CUNY Academic Works. Megan has worked at New York Public Library, New York University, and most recently at Barnard College. She's also an active Wikipedian. She's guided by the principle that Wikipedia is the encyclopedia anyone can edit, and she works to increase contributions by and about women and other marginalized people. So thank you, Megan, so much for your time today, and I look forward to your presentation. Thank you so much, Jessica. Um, before I begin, I really want to uh, give a special thanks to Jessica and the SUNY Council of Library Directors for organizing this series and for inviting me to be a part of it. During today's webinar, I will provide an introduction to open access, the what and the why, as well as provide a framing for understanding open access in its best form as a return to scholar-led publishing practices. So let's go back. In the mid-15th century, the Gutenberg printing press revolutionized how people thought of the world they lived in and communicated that to others. It revolu revolutionized scholarly publishing, too. Universities began to establish presses, first in England and then the English colonies, and they did this for the purpose of promoting education and scholarship and disseminating the research produced by their institutions. In the mid-17th century, there was a move to provide a cooperative forum for scientists and those interested in scientific work. The period saw the foundation of scholarly societies, including the Royal Society of London. Henry Oldenburg was the first secretary to the Royal Society, and he was responsible for reading out loud the letters he received from scientists about their research and also writing to report scientific developments in England back to them. This is how research was communicated. But Oldenburg was focused on developing new knowledge through research and experimentation. And in 1665, he began editing and binding the letters from scientists, thereby creating the philosophical transactions of the Royal Society of London, which more accurately uh, looked like this, and today is regarded as the oldest scientific journal in the English-speaking world. Fast forward to another small innovation. The internet offers researchers and scholars a new means of disseminating information. And since its earliest days, it's been used to openly share their work online. 
In the 1990s, a number of research communities established preprint servers, including Archive in Physics, FreePEC in Economics, and SSRN in the Social Scientists, all of which advanced the pace of scientific progress. In contrast, commercial publishers harness the internet to shift from a model in which journal content is purchased and held by our libraries to one in which it is licensed. So that despite the lower distribution costs for publishers, remember there are no stamps to buy, there is less paper to print, uh, we saw a dramatic rise in the price of journal subscriptions, one that drastically outmatched inflation and our library's budgets. And publishers' profit margins continue to rise. In fact, they often outpace those of companies like Starbucks, Apple, Disney, and Google. And I realize this data is uh, somewhat out of date. It's from uh, 2007 or 2008, so please let me correct this uh, one point. In 2015, Elsevier's profit margins were actually 37%, so they've continued to rise. And if you think about it, these profits are supported by a system in which you and your peers write the work, you review the work, and you edit the journals that publish the work. Yet when you want to read a work or you want your work to be read, you are too often locked out by a paywall. So how many of us have had that experience of conducting a Google search and then being asked to pay 30, 40, $50 for an article. And all we've seen is the abstract. We don't know yet if it's an article that we want to read and use. This experience happens to us, it happens to our students, and to our peers. In fact, many of the faculty I work with here at CUNY don't have access to the works that they themselves have written. And so if you take a step back, it becomes clear that something is wrong. There is a crisis in how information is both accessed and used, leading to what librarian Charbooth Char refers to as information privilege, the clear divide between those that are able to access information and those that cannot. But there's an alternative, open access. There are a few different definitions out there, um, but when I talk about open access, I mean access and ideally use of information without financial, legal, or technical barriers. So free to read to anyone with an internet connection. And for those new to open access, it can sometimes feel like this is something outside of our work, as something other or in addition to. But it is very much a pragmatic solution to a real problem in scholarly communication. It is a movement, and here I'm borrowing from the Budapest definition of open access, which brings together the relatively new technology of the internet with the tradition of scholars making their work available for the sake of inquiry and knowledge, to support academic freedom, to disseminate work so that it can be read and built upon, not to create an information divide between those that can pay and those that cannot. And here I really want to stress that open access is a distribution model, one which is independent from how the content is produced. So it supports many different peer review systems, open, blind, what have you. The focus here is on access. Open access content is made available in two ways. Open access journals, uh, which make content immediately available online at the time of publication. There are currently over 9,000 vetted journals listed in the directory of open access journals. And these have all different economic models. Some are supported by a library or an institution, and others by author fees, although this is a small minority. Open access is also about supporting author choice. Whether an author publishes in an open, app, open access or subscription-based journal, she can choose to self-archive that work in an open access repository which be, can be specific to an institution, a discipline, or a funder. These two models of open access are sometimes referred to as gold open access and green open access, but for the purposes of clarity, I like to stay away from this kind of jargon. So this often raises questions about copyright. 
depositing to an institutional repository. Because after an article has been written, peer-reviewed, and edited, the author is often asked to sign a copyright transfer agreement that gives the publisher all or some of their rights to that work. But scholars can publish and keep their rights. And in fact, most journals allow authors to keep some rights. There is actually a database of publisher copyright policies, Sherpa Romeo, uh, Romeo if you're feeling particularly fancy. And of the 2,300 journals listed there, 80% allow authors to submit a version of their article in a repository. In most cases, it's the author's accepted manuscript, so the final peer-reviewed and edited version, but without all of the publisher's formatting. Regardless of whether a work is made available in an open access journal or a repository, these works are easily discovered via search engines such as Google and Google Scholar, um, as well as via our library's discovery tools. And this means that readers can come to them naturally wherever they conduct their research. So who benefits from open access? Well, everyone. Students have access to the works they need when they are in our classrooms and after they graduate from our institutions. When I think about concepts like lifelong learning, I also start to think about a recent study done by Project Information Literacy. This is a study uh, where there were uh, a little less than uh, 2,000 students from 10 institutions, from R1 to community colleges, so a pretty representative sample. And they asked these students how they were finding and using resources in their personal and professional lives after they left the institution. 73% found it difficult to locate affordable sources, and about half were frustrated because they lost access to their library's databases, such as JSTOR and ProQuest. But 27% of these former students were using content that they found via open access repositories as a part of their professional lives. Open, so open access benefits researchers and other readers regardless of their affiliation or their ability to pay. This includes our students, uh, Wikipedians, where I spend a lot of my time, as well as researchers at nonprofit public health organizations and your doctor. Open access also benefits the author and her work. By making a work openly accessible, it is shared with those that can't access it, which can lead to further collaboration and opportunities. And it provides increased visibility via search engines so that when a work is read more, it can be cited more. This graph clearly shows uh, what's referred to as the citation advantage for research that's been made openly available over that which lives behind a paywall. There have been a number of studies done in this area, and the advantage does vary by the quality of the research as well as the discipline. But re reviews of this scholarship have shown that by making a work publicly accessible, citations of that work increase, sometimes by up to 600%. Open access works are more visible to journalists as well. There are many examples of this, but I like to share the experiences of people I know. It makes it more tangible for me. And so I was excited a few months ago to see that a 2015 dissertation from a former student of the CUNY Graduate Center was cited in an Atlantic article about marginalized families being pushed out of PTAs. This is a work that would otherwise be un unavailable um, or locked up within ProQuest, but by making it publicly available, it was able to enrich this particular story. I also think about the experience of one of my friends. He published an article in 2013 asking, does recreational computer use affect high school achievement? This is a very important topic. So he made a copy of it available in his institution's repository, um, otherwise, it would have cost readers about $40 to buy it from Springer. And over the course of a couple years, he tweeted out of the conference or mention it while giving a paper. And we can see related spikes in views and in downloads, 
indicating a real-time engagement in conversation around the work. And then something really interesting happened last fall. His publicly available work was picked up and written into publicly accessible language by the popular science blog IFL Science, uh, which, if you're not familiar with it, is for people who really love science. And at the time, this post received about 10,000 likes on Facebook. There was a related spike in views and in some downloads. And it's conceivable that of those likes and the people that came to his work, that it included a high school educator who could access the work, read the work, and assess whether or not it was appropriate to integrate into their daily practice. Open access is a movement. It's a movement of researchers and scholars, but also of students, provosts, funding bodies, and the general public. And from federal funding mandates to the first state open access policy, the open access movement has gained an incredible amount of momentum. Research funded by federal agencies, by public tax dollars, must now be made accessible to that public. And so while many scholars have to make their work publicly available, many choose to do so. Their actions are affecting tangible change so that the open access movement is no longer a fringe group, but it's moved into the mainstream. So that now, supported by libraries and their societies, scholars are building the infrastructure so that open access becomes a sustainable model for the long term. Starting with the Public Library of Science, a nonprofit OA project which published its first journal in 2003, to the Open Library of Humanities, which launched just last year, both of these projects are run by scholars and are in service to scholarly interests. So that when six editors and 31 editorial board members of the prestigious journal Lingua resigned in protest of Elsevier's subscription costs and practices, the Open Library of the Humanities was able to work with them to start a new journal, Glossa, that met their needs. Martin Eve, uh, the founder of the Open Library of Humanities and a professor at University of London, remarked that right away it is 50% cheaper to run this journal through us than it was when it was with Elsevier. Researchers are making their research output in all its forms, from conference presentations to journal articles to the data they're built upon, openly available via repositories. There are currently over 2,700 institutional repositories worldwide. I have the great privilege of working with the 24 colleges and schools that make up the City University of New York, where we launched our institutional repository just last year, CUNY Academic Works. This site serves as a single place to share and to showcase the intellectual life and the intellectual history of the institution. And we were able to create this because the University Faculty Senate, representing 12,000 full and part-time faculty, recognized that open access is deeply aligned with CUNY's commitment to educating the public and making knowledge accessible and affordable. And so they called for the establishment of an institutional repository. Scholars are also sharing their work through disciplinary repositories, starting first with Archive, which launched as a preprint server in 1991, and more recently with Soch Archive, uh, which happened to launch uh, soon after Elsevier's acquisition of SSRN, which had traditionally served scholars in this area. Many of you have probably heard about BioArchive from this New York Times article from earlier this year. It describes a group of researchers who were not so much rogue as they were committed to advancing the pace of discovery, particularly in light of the Zika virus. So they shared their preprints online and before submitting them through traditional journal channels, uh, which would slow their release by months or even years. 
And I should comment that they did this uh, with the permission uh, of their publishers so that they could address this very important issue. We've also seen the disciplinary relationships more formalized with scholarly societies. In 2011, the Modern Language Association established an Office of Scholarly Communications and began investigating how it could facilitate the open exchange of research among its membership. Supported by this office and its director, Kathleen Fitzpatrick, the MLA revised all of its author agreements so that scholars are empowered to submit their work into a repository. It gives the rights back to the authors. And then they took an extra step. They launched their own repository so that every member has a place to share their work, regardless of whether they're affiliated with an institution. This began uh, first as MLA Commons, an open source social networking site, which was built in partnership with the Academic Commons team uh, here at the City University of New York. And then they built out the repository component, MLA Core, in partnership with Columbia University's Center for Digital Research and Scholarship. So what about academia.edu? I hear this question a lot, both about academia.edu and about ResearchGate. And what I find really heartening about both of these services, academia.edu and ResearchGate, is that it shows that scholars want to share. They want to be read by their peers, because ultimately, that is why we write the work, to be read. But academia.edu is not a repository. It's a social networking site that, much like Facebook, sells user data. That is, despite its domain, it is a commercial company with commercial interests. So for me, the question is, how do those interests align with your interests as a scholar, now and in the future? If we dig deep into the terms of service, we can actually see that by posting a work to the site, a researcher grants academia.edu a license to distribute the work and to transfer that right to others. If they don't go out of business, private and for-profit companies like academia.edu are sold. But the libraries that run institutional and disciplinary repositories commit to making that work available in the long term. And we advocate for the rights of the author as well. So that when Elsevier sent a massive takedown notice to academia.edu, as they did in 2013, academia.edu was required to take all of that content down. And their commercial status uh, really contributed to um, their being required to do so. So there is still work to be done. As much as open access has moved into the mainstream, it is our responsibility to make sure that it remains a movement led by and in service to scholars. Academic publishing is a $25 billion a year business, and large commercial publishers want to maintain their monopoly on the knowledge economy. So while they've come on board and adapted their practices in response to some author demands, They've also taken steps to subvert scholar-led initiatives and to use open access to grow their profit margins. So what can you do? You can commit to making your work openly available. Publish in open access journals. And if you're interested in doing this, I recommend going to the directory of open access journal to find a journal that's right for you and for your work. And regardless of whether you publish in an open or subscription journal, know your rights as an author so that you can retain the ability to share your work as you see fit. So that you can share it with your students, with your peers, or via an open access repository. And if you're not sure if your institution or discipline has a repository, there is a directory of open access repositories online but you can also reach out to a librarian. We are here to help.
But most of all, join the conversation so that you can take action. You've already taken the first step by joining today's webinar, and there are some stellar speakers lined up for the rest of the week. They are, they are going to address issues from alternative review models, to open educational resources, to starting and sustaining your first OA publication, to understanding and protecting your rights as an author. As Jessica mentioned earlier, this series is organized as part of Open Access Week an annual event which encourages individuals to take action across the globe. And I hope you do take action. Talk to your colleagues, talk to your editors, to your scholarly societies, and continue the conversation that we've started today. So I wanted to be sure and leave some time for a productive conversation and some questions. Thank you so much um, for joining. And my information, as well as my slides, um, are all available online to be accessed and used. OK. Um, can you hear me all right? I'm going to assume. OK, great. Thanks. Um, so I see some questions coming in on chat. And the first question, and I think what I hear a lot of other people sharing, is the fear that disrupting the traditional publishing cycle might lead to predatory publishers. Um, so Megan, could you tell us a little bit about your experience helping people understand that open doesn't necessarily mean anything? Uh, it's such a great question. Um, and I know that this is, this is a question that I hear a lot as well. Um, you know, if I publish in an open access journal, uh, you know, I know that that work will be publicly accessible, but is it going to go through the same peer review processes? How do I know that I can trust the journal that I'm working with? Um, just as with subscription-based journals, uh, with open access journals, there are journals of high quality and high impact and journals that perhaps um, you don't want to be adding into your tenure file. Um, so what I really recommend um, is working with the Directory of Open Access Journals, uh, which recently did a massive review of all of the journals that it includes there to make sure that they are adhering to transparent um, and ethical publishing practices. Um, but also, if you're considering working with a journal, look at that journal, um, you know, who is on the editorial board? Um, what sorts of review process do they have in place? How quickly does that review process take? So if they're going to um, review and publish your work within a matter of two weeks, then perhaps they're not putting that time in to both review and edit it and turn it into um, uh, that more valuable work. I also want to make a little plug. Um, there is a website called Think, Check, Submit, uh, which has some really great guidance uh, for authors that want to make sure that they appropriately assess a journal that they're interested in working with. Uh, and that was thinkcheck.submit.org. Um, and Megan, there was another question about um, book chapter publishing. Um, a lot of us tend to focus on articles that tends to be the majority of what's published. Do you have any experience um, about book chapter rights? Yes. Um, you know, my background is actually uh, in the performing arts, so in the humanities. And so this is a question that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, you know, book chapters, for a long time, it was a, it was a big struggle. Um, 
But increasingly what we've seen is that publishers are willing, if not to make the whole book available open access, um, they will allow their authors to submit a chapter to a repository. There is usually a period uh, that they ask that that work is um, under an embargo. Um, but I know, for instance, that Oxford University Press and Cambridge University Press um, you know, have default policies that allow authors to submit to an institutional or disciplinary repository. I'll also say that as a part of my work uh, here at CUNY, I regularly work with authors um, either at the point of signing a contract with a book publisher um, or you know, years after it's been published. Um, we use the resource provided by the Authors Alliance about um, rights reversion, and we reach out to the publisher to ask not only if we can make a copy available in an institutional repository, but if we can actually have full copyright revert back to the author. Perhaps at this point, the um, company is no longer publishing it, they are no longer um, making a profit from it, and so the author wants to make sure that it finds new readers. We've had very strong success with that, uh, particularly in relationship to um, openly available textbooks. So we've had a number of authors who've reached out, had full rights revert back to them, and then they've chosen to make it available in an institutional repository and to sign a Creative Commons license to it so that um, others can use and build upon that work. Um, thank you for that, Megan. One thing that I'm interested in you sharing is maybe telling us a little bit about how you built some grassroots support um, across CUNY to start populating your institutional repository. Because you've been working on that for what, about two years now, if I remember correctly? Yeah, a little bit under two years. Yeah. Um, so, you know, at CUNY, we were very fortunate. Our university faculty senate passed a statement and resolution on open access back in 2011. Um, and my colleague, Jill Ciarcella, who will be speaking on Friday, was you know, really led the way in terms of making that happen. Um, fast forward a few years, I arrived in January of 2015. Um, and because CUNY is such a large institution, um, just depending on how you count it, we have between, um, you know, a quarter to half a million students um, distributed at 24 different schools across the five boroughs of the city of New York. So it's a very large organization. Um, and so we had a two, really a two-pronged outreach approach. Um, first, uh, to really um, engage the libraries and the librarians um, so that they, in turn, can reach out to their campuses. Um, but also, you know, we spend a lot of time uh, speaking with faculty one-on-one, -on -one, um, having conversations about them and their work and their need. Um, you know, so going to uh, new faculty orientations, um, you know, having uh, conversations about how to find and evaluate potential publishers, uh, both journal and book publishers, um, as well as regularly having authors' rights workshops so that they can make their work available, and then um, and then working with them to distribute it online. So that both through the repository, but also through online profiles. Um, one of my colleagues, uh, Robin Camille Davis at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, likes to say that um, the internet is your business card. Um, I really don't think it can be said better than that. Um, and so we work with faculty to make sure that their work is available online. Thank you. There are quite a few people who are interested in the CUNY policy, um, but I would guess that that happened a little bit before you arrived. Um, so are, are you able to share with us a little bit about the history of that open access policy and maybe what's been happening since it was passed? Yeah. Um, so 
I should clarify that the um, the text that I shared, and I can see that Jill Ciaricella uh, is typing in the um, chat box, so I definitely keep your eye on that. Um, but it is a statement and resolution on open access, which is separate from a more formalized policy that would grant a license to the university. Um, we have found that faculty um, see open access as directly related to their work as scholars, um, but also the work that we do here at CUNY um, in service uh, to our immediate communities. Um, and so there has been a lot of support for open access here. Um, you know, we do sometimes have those same shared struggles uh, that uh, libraries have in terms of, you know, faculty have dinner to make and papers to write. So taking that extra five to ten minutes to submit to an institutional repository um, sometimes doesn't always happen. Um, but we work with them to make sure that they're um, empowered to do so. I would hope uh, that in the future um, we can uh, formalize this work uh, bypassing a more formalized policy, but of course that would have to be something that the faculty um, really lead the way on. So Megan, there's a more nuanced question in the chat from Kathleen Nicholson and she says how does this um, assuming this means open access help those of us whose expertise is in the way we formulate and then transfer existing information and skills so the insights and methods are our currency as she's saying and then John Schumacher says OA is geared towards work uh, for which the author is not expecting direct compensation so I guess have you seen any models where, um, you know, it's almost like a flipped model for different types of, of publishing, and is that something that happens through your institutional repository? And I can read that again if you can't find it in the chat. No, so. could you read that again? That would be really helpful. Sure. Cool. Thank you. So this is Kathleen Nicholson, and I'm just going to read it as she wrote. So how does this help those of us whose expertise is in the way we formulate and then transfer existing information and skills. So our insights and methods are our currency. Um, and maybe Kathleen, if you're still there, could you pro provide a little bit of clarification? Because I think that that's a really important question. Um, and maybe you're talking about book publishing. That's okay. So lots of people are typing. Okay, and I see Kathleen is typing, so let's just wait a moment. Well, and as Ke Kathleen uh, types her response, and I, I look forward to that, um, I will say that when uh, an author chooses to make their work available through an open access repository, it doesn't affect the copyright status of that work. Um, so authors, when they're submitting to CUNY Academic Works, when they're submitting to Social Archive, um, they retain copyright to that work. So if someone else is to use it, um, they need to be um, provide the appropriate attribution um, or, in many cases, reach out to the author and request permission um, if they're going to do something beyond citing that work. And so by making your work openly available, you're um, allowing that work to reach new readers. Um, as well as to really mark your space in that area. Um, you know, the moment from when a research project is, uh, you know, sort of first conceived and conceptualized um, to the moment that it is published or performed, um, there can be many years between that. But by putting it in a repository, um, you know, it's given a date um, to uh, stake your claim in that uh, particular area of your field. So I think, um, Megan, it sounds like what you're saying um, is that you would actually have more rights as authors because open access, you know, better preserves your rights in many cases. Um, I see 
Uh, someone else said, could you speak of, on how university libraries are providing funding for APCs? And actually, um, Jill from CUNY is going to be talking more about APCs um, and authors' rights this Friday. Um, but Megan, if you have any experience with that, it would be nice to hear your perspective as well. Yes, of course. You know, APCs, I, I really feel like we're at an important moment in the open access movement uh, here in the States, um, specifically around APCs. Uh, for those that uh, may not be familiar with them, uh, APCs refers to uh, article processing charges. And this is a model in which um, an open access journal is supported by fees that the author pays to publish in that journal. Uh, I do want to stress that uh, this is a minority of journals and that when I looked at the directory of open access journals uh, just last night, only 20% of the journals there reported uh, charging APCs. Um, I suspect it's a little higher, but, uh, but the point is it is a minority. So many institutions will uh, provide a fund, uh, whether it's in the library or an Office of Research and Sponsored Programs, uh, to pay the fees that authors uh, are asked to publish in a particular journal. And many authors' grants will also pay those fees. Um, we've seen this, uh, this model emerge uh, more in European countries um, and steadily emerging in the States as well. Um, I struggle with APCs, um, and I struggle with APCs particularly being at an underfunded institution um, in that, you know, as much as we talk about the paywall is a barrier, um, with a model, a journal that operates under APCs, it's a model in which my faculty can read the work, but they may not be able to respond to and you know, participate in the conversation. I tried to make hashtag APC wall take off and it didn't quite happen, but that's okay. Um, and so, you know, for me, I really like looking to an institution, to um, Latin America, where the open access movement was, um, for me, really born. Um, uh, you know, might not have used the term open access. Um, that's relatively new in the early aughts. Um, but they have a model that is government funded, library supported, and scholar led. So they don't have repositories because content is um, automatically made available open access. And it doesn't operate on an APC model in order to do that. I also get a lot of questions uh, here at CUNY about um, hybrid journals, so journals that authors can choose to pay a fee if they want to make their work openly accessible, but um, you know they're not required to do so. They can publish and have it behind a paywall as well. Um, some people like to refer to this as double dipping. Um, and I think one of the important things to remember, though, is that even with those journals, a faculty member still has um, the opportunity to retain rights to their work so that they don't have to pay you know, upwards of $5,000 to publish it open access, but they can choose to make a version of the work accessible in an open access repository. So they still have app, um, access to that distribution model. And so um, Kathleen got back with us, and um, let me just scroll up to read. Uh, what she had written. So she says, I, so this is Kathleen Nicholson, she says, I teach a ceramic design class where the academic aspect is how to encourage skill, um, skills and development as well as directing research. Um, and so it sounds like this person isn't necessarily talking about the publishing side. So how does open access encompass a broader array of um, scholarly output, I guess. So I guess is there an open access movement that's outside of, or outside of you know like the written word type of publishing? It's kind ah, of interesting. It is such an interesting question, and you know it's one of those things too. Um, wow, you know I, I can speak to to my area of expertise, uh, which is in dance. Um, and so uh, when I was at Barnard College, I worked with uh, students and faculty in the study and practice of dance, theater, film, and music. 
And I was also supporting open access. Um, and I think that sometimes there is a bit of a, um, a cultural divide when we have these conversations around publishing. Um, but that ultimately is it, a, it is around uh, visibility in your work. Um, or visibility of your work. I know that um, in dance, uh, you know, one's work couldn't be copyrighted unless it was, um, well, really, I will not give the whole complicated history here. I will spare you. Um, but it was really uh, formalized with the 1976 Copyright Act, uh, which we are just celebrating the 40th anniversary of. Um, but it requires that dance is put into a fixed form. So that for a lot of choreographers, um, you know, putting your work in that fixed form, you know, videotaping it or whatever it may be and distributing it um, will not only yield uh, greater visibility of your work, but it also does show, um, you know, your particular, uh, you know, movement lexicon um, should someone else uh, be working in that area. So, but because dance was not copyrightable until 1976, I see within that culture um, many individuals uh, having a reluctance to share their works online. Um, and so uh, I, I, I hope to see that change in, the, in future years. And I really appreciate your question, Kathleen. Um, so a question from UNLV Libraries. Do you have many authors who are reluctant to post uh, pre-prints, um, uh, meaning they they would prefer to post the final versions in your repository? So are people reluctant to post maybe something that's a bit more of a draft? Right. Such a good question. And I find that, as with most things in open access, it does depend on the discipline. Um, so, you know, our faculty who work in public health um, are generally federally funded. They're very used to being required to submit a version of their work to PubMed Central and therefore are very happy to submit that final um, accepted manuscript to the institutional repository. Faculty in the humanities, um, you know, I find are a little bit more reluctant. They're not used to sharing that um, earlier version, even if it's the exact same language that is in the final publisher's PDF. Um, there is something to, you know, having a certain margin spacing and uh, font uh, that grants the work a certain amount of authority. Um, so it's a conversation. We are always sure uh, to provide the citation um, to the version of record. Um, and I find that that often helps faculty, um, you know, that someone can first come to it through the accepted version we make available, and then they have the opportunity to move on to that final peer-reviewed and edited version. Okay, another question is, uh, do you have any advice on getting starting getting started working with faculty, um, particularly around posting those already published works um, to an IR, um, or even working with publishers to gain permission? Yeah, so um, this is a really important question, particularly when you are in the early stages of developing your IR, you want to feed a lot of content into it. I'd like to say that content begats content, um, and so you want to make it look like a rich place um, for people to go to. Um, one of the services that we do offer to select faculty member uh, here is to conduct a CV review. So reaching out to them, letting them know how important their work is to us, because it is, um, getting a copy of their CV, and then we have a workflow um, in place, and I'm uh, happy to share it with folks, um, where we look up the default copyright policies for each of those the journals that they work with, um, and with the permission of the researcher, um, we'll reach out to uh, publishers to get permission for the works that we don't have. Many times, um, you know, we'll find that a small percentage we can put the publisher's PDF into the repository, um, but that most of the publications, um, journals, require that we put the accepted manuscript in. 
and we don't have access to it. And if we're going to be honest, the faculty largely don't have access to that version um, either. This is becoming increasingly true as editing processes happen within a system. But there are a number of uh, publishers that if you reach out to them and ask them for a copy of the accepted manuscript, they will provide it to you. I see folks I talking about it being labor intensive. And yes, it is a labor intensive process, but um, there's really nothing better than seeing, a, you know, setting a work free. Um, let's see. So, sorry, there's just a lot of questions coming in all of a sudden. Um, so I guess a procedural question is how large is the staff working on that project and approximately how many CVs do you process in a semester? And I know CVs can vary widely, so could you give us an estimate of the, the ROI? Ah, um, so this depends a lot, uh, depending on how you look at it. Uh, you know, the staffing model at CUNY is, is very different. Um, I am a scholarly communications office of one. Um, I work in the CUNY central office, and I have the great fortune of working with the 31 libraries of CUNY. At each of CUNY's 24 schools, we have an appointed academic works coordinator um, who is responsible uh, for uh, speaking to the repository, working in support of it, um, at their local institution. Um, and this is typically a librarian, um, and they come from all sorts of different uh, backgrounds and areas of expertise. Um, but these librarians have, um, don't have anything taken off of their plate. Um, so I, I sometimes like to refer to our, our model as the subject liaison model, you know, kind of um, on steroids. Uh, so our actual FTE is quite small. Um, and CV reviews are something that we commit to doing, uh, you know, for X number of hours per week. Um, you know, sometimes, for instance, during open access week, uh, I might not be able to carve out that space. Um, but I find that with each CV that we do, um, we get a big return on investment um, because that faculty member um, then begins to submit uh, to the repository directly and because, you um, you know, they in turn can serve as our advocate to their colleagues. We've also engaged in some harvesting processes, so going to other open access repositories and if the content is openly licensed and only if the content is openly licensed and we have permission to do so, uh, bringing that work into our repository uh, to, to further the engagement. And we've had a number of faculty reach out to us as a result of that work. You know, I think that's such a smart approach to say, you know, here's this seemingly insurmountable task, but you know what, we're all going to do an hour or two a week and just slowly chip away. And then you have those local advocates. Um, I think that that's a really smart and exciting way to approach a, a really huge but also really, really important and crucial task. So uh, kudos to whoever came up with that idea. <laughs> um, so we only have just a few minutes left, and I have um, just a sentence or two to wrap up. Um, so I'm sorry we didn't get to all of the questions. There are a lot of good questions there. Um, but I wanted to know, Megan, do you have any you know, closing thoughts that you'd like us um, to hear before we wrap up today? Yeah, so I think for me, um, it's really a matter of staying engaged in the conversation. Um, we really are at a turning point as publishers begin to um, offer, you know, what are being, uh, you know, sort of characterized as new services to libraries um, and to their faculty. Um, and I think that it's healthy to have um, a little bit of skepticism and to think, you know, how do our interests align? Um, how do their interests align with ours um, as scholars? as librarians. Um, and so I just have so much appreciation uh, for everyone for joining us today. Um, and I look forward to continuing the conversation.
Thank you so much. This is such a fantastic way to get started um, with our SUNY Open Access Week and Open Access Week in general. Um, like you said, this isn't something that happens in five days and then goes away. So I'm really appreciative of your time and all of the work that you put in getting ready for today. I learned so much. So thank you so much um, with, for a very, very engaging presentation. Thank you for sharing our slides. I know that a lot of people have already asked me that. Um, and for those of you who are attending today, um, and throughout the week, there's going to be a very brief survey. It should take you less than two minutes, um, just so we can make sure that we're um, crafting the type of programming that is helpful and also to start thinking about future steps. Um, so please take just two minutes to review the series um, and provide a provide us with some feedback so we can focus future open access efforts. Um, you'll get an email um, just a few minutes after this presentation ends. Um, your input is really highly valued and we appreciate you spending some time with us today. Um, if you know someone who would like to see this webinar but couldn't make it today, all of the webinars will be posted on the SUNY Open Access website. Um, and I'm going to add the link there again in the chat box. Just give me one second to paste that in there. Um, so there's more information about the upcoming webinars this week. Um, the archived version will be available um, there for viewing, so you can share, you can revisit, um, you can, you know, maybe purpose, purposefully point people um, to this type of information. And of course, if you're not available to see any of the other presentations, you can always check back at a later date. So tomorrow we have um, Heather Joseph from Spark talking about the bigger picture of open access, which will talk more about the different types of um, reviewing models and emerging practices. Wednesday we've got SUNY Open Educational Resources Services. Um, that's Allison Brown. Um, we'll have um, Molly and Amy from University at Buffalo's The Reading Room about starting and sustain sustaining an open access publication. Um, their publication is The Reading Room. It's really great. Um, and then Friday, we have Jill from, from CUNY talking about understanding and protecting your rights as authors. And she'll talk about APCs and a few other things. Um, and I see in the chat box, um, Matthew Kopel from CLRC has also included a link to the survey. And for those of you who are hosting viewing parties, you can um, provide just one um, uh, survey response per group if that is easier for you. Just make sure that you try to keep track of how many um, people were attending um, just so we can have a sense of what the reach for this um, for this webinar is. So uh, I hope everyone will join me in thanking Megan and I hope that I will see you next uh, tomorrow. So thank you all very much. I hope you have a great day.